Uh, thanks so much, Nathan. I'm more nervous here than anything else because I'm from Buckley, so speaking here is like scary. Anyway, Nathan thanked the, the women behind the men. I'm one of the women standing beside the men, if not in front of them. You can tell I'm a Buckley girl, can't you? Anyway, yes, I'm a Buckley girl. I lived and grew up on Mould Road, in fact. My dad's buried in Bistry Church. My mum died last month, uh, having lived for the last few years in Marleyfield Care Home in Buckley. And just by the way, a shout out to care workers everywhere for the fantastic underpaid uh, work they do. <laughs> Secret heroes. My parents came here as Irish immigrants and were made to feel incredibly welcome. And all right, we supported Ireland in the rugby first, <laughs> but then Wales. But the main thing is Buckley was home. In Buckley, I got my first taste of political betrayal, in fact. As a sixth former at uh, St. Richard Gwynne in Flint, they organised a local event here in Buckley with the then Labour MP, Barry Jones. And he promised that there would be no job losses at Shot and Steelworks. And I believed him. And then, guess what? Mass job losses. Shot and Steelworks finished. The place where all my schoolmates were going to do their apprentices ended just like that. It was my first bitter lesson of idealism shattered by the Labour Party locally. And they've carried on betraying this area ever since. And yet the Labour Party have taken voters in this area for granted, telling them short, selling them short, but still assuming that we'd all trot out and vote for them, a really complacent Labour establishment. And we know about the Labour establishment, don't we? Because Labour runs Wales. And you only have to look at the state of education and health and social care in Wales to show what a debacle that's been. Well, we've had enough. If ever, if ever the lie of devolution came alive, it's here in Wales. You know that argument that if you bring the government physically closer to people, it'll mean that they're more in tune with uh, ordinary people. Well, that's completely contradicted by the Welsh government. The Welsh Assembly might as well be far away in Strasbourg as Cardiff because it's so distant from the interests of ordinary people here in Flintshire. And let's be honest, the members of that Welsh uh, Assembly feel far more at home with Brussels bureaucrats than Buckley Brexiteers. <laughs> that estrangement was completed by what happened in relation to Brexit and voting leave in 2016. In one of my more glamorous roles, I write for the MJ, the Municipal Journal. And when I argued in that, because it's, it's for all council uh, uh, people everywhere, I argued that many in Wales would vote leave to take back control. I argued that ahead of the referendum. And I was met by smug dismissal, largely by Labour councillors and politicians in Wales, who said, why would Welsh turkeys vote for Christmas? After all, Wales gets far more from the EU money uh, than anywhere else in the UK. They wouldn't be so daft. Well, apart from the fact that that EU money is our money, the main issue, the main issue for me was that patronising and condescending thought that Welsh voters could be bought off with a few trinkets from Brussels. We know that that was about taking back control. We didn't want a few crumbs from the EU table. We want it to be taken seriously as equals, as citizens, not the recipients of like social work grandiose handouts from Brussels. It's about dignity, about jobs, about creating our own future ourselves and not depending on them. So finally, I think Brexit has broken down the red wall and revealed once and for all that the Labour Party holds voters in contempt. They have turned on Leave voters. They didn't just ignore our vote. They actually turned on us, demonising Leavers as xenophobic racists, or, if they were being kind, somehow easily manipulated, too uneducated and stupid to understand the complexity of leaving uh, EU. We were all conned. They then became the Remain Party and have done for this referendum. But now, when they look at the polls, they're in a bit of a panic because they realise that maybe they've taken the Labour heartlands for granted. They realise they've made a bit of a mistake. 
They're trying to disguise that second referendum as a you get to decide, you take control. Now, maybe the Labour Party have been fooled by their own propaganda and think we're so dim and stupid that we'll buy this nonsense, but we won't because we aren't. Voters actually know better that in the absence of Brexit being uh, delivered, uh, uh, we know that why should uh, we trust any politicians to deliver on anything else? Labour promises a radical agenda under Corbyn, but if they're too scared to take on the vested interests of the EU, too scared of the radical change embodied by Brexit, then actually how can we trust them to do anything radical at all? In the end, they're just the supporters of the status quo in Europe. So, it's so bad that now many Labour voters who are so sceptical of Labour that they're considering voting Tories. And we have to be honest, there are a lot of people thinking that. That's not because, by the way, they've all become Tories overnight. They might loan their votes to the Tory party, but they're deeply sceptical about Boris and his deal. And in fact, they resent the Tories being the only choice on offer. But they aren't the only choice on offer. And I think it's important that the Brexit party stamps on this myth that you only have a choice between the two main parties. A couple of words of warning about the new brexit -y Tory party. Take the discussion on the withdrawal deal. Boris calls it microwave oven-ready deal. Well, I think it's more like the heated up leftovers of Theresa May's main course myself. <laughs> since the general election's been called, since the general election's been called, certainly the Tories have talked the Leave talk but I think they seem very reluctant to walk the leave walk. My main, their main message, rather, is get Brexit done, and to quote Boris, so that we can focus on matters that matter to the public. But that suggests that we should just get Brexit out of the way, put it behind us, as though that's not what is of a matter to the public. They are actually removing the opportunity of shaping the future from us because it's obvious that from their point of view, they're actually rather scared of the democratic potential of Brexit. This get Brexit done slogan seems to me to be all around depoliticising the issue, just turn it into a technical matter to be, dis and, and we the voters, dispensed with, just called on to be a stage army in this election and then told to toddle back home while the big people, the grown-ups, get on with running the country. Well, that's not what Brexit meant for me. We are the grown-ups in the room. We came on the stage of history and we're not going anywhere. I understand, I understand that the Tories appeal to voter exhaustion, and we are exhausted. We're worn out. We've been battered. We've been thrown against the wall. We nearly lost. So when they say, let's end this, let's go back to normal, it's tempting, isn't it? But what they want to do is to restore the... Uh, the status quo, and as I say, push voters to the sidelines, uh, not centre stage. It's an appeal for politics and a return to the same old, same old and back to usual. But for me, what Brexit was really all about was the excitement of us grabbing back control from Brussels. But now it looks like it's going to, that control is going to be stolen from us again, but this time by the British establishment, and we shouldn't let them get away with that. The Tory party's obsession in this election, by the way, up and down the country where I've been speaking, is not about getting Brexit done. It's about destroying the Brexit party, which doesn't seem very appealing to me. They don't seem to like a new radical party, a party without which Brexit would have been defeated and the Tory party would have sold us out. In many areas, the campaign literature for the Tories is all focused on the Brexit party, which at least shows we're setting the agenda, but actually shows that they've got a different agenda. They demand that the Brexit party stand down candidates and they scaremonger about splitting the votes. And I won't lie to you, it's horrible when leavers turn on leavers. We've all experienced it over the last few weeks. When they say that the Brexit party is putting Brexit at risk, we all hate that kind of blue on blue sort of pressure where you're feeling like, am I doing the right thing? But there's an arrogant assumption here that all Brexit party voters would automatically switch to the Tories, and that's a nonsense. Because actually, many people, if they weren't going to vote Brexit party, would just go back to Labour, or wouldn't vote at all, or would spoil their ballot papers, which I don't want them to do. 
And it's an irony in this area, in Wales, that voting Tories would actually let Labour back in, and they would be the splitters in many instances. But we're used to this sort of scaremongering, and we've heard it before from the Tories, haven't we? Do you remember George Osborne? Another one that we'd all wish that we'd forget, but anyway, he's still around. But remember when George Osborne said, if you vote leave, it'll be like jumping off a cliff into the unknown. And he lined up with the CBI and the bosses of the multinationals, and they said, vote for leave will lead to economic dystopia and instability. Locally, at Airbus, the bosses actually t said to their employees, they gave them lurid tales of job losses. They basically threatened them. You vote leave, you lose your job. And we all listened to that scaremongering, didn't we? And what happened? Voters heard all of the talk of worst case scenarios, but they took courage in hand, refused to be bullied, and they voted leave regardless. And that's not because they were stupid, but because leavers are risk takers, prepared to take a gamble, and are courageous despite the threats. And we should gather that courage together now, today, as well. That's the, that's the problem for me. The mainstream two-party system even put forward by the Brexit Tories, basically ring fences off politics as usual and says, do not disturb. They continue to be risk averse, to rely on fear mongering, to preach a safe, non-disruptive version of politics post Brexit. That shows that they have no appetite for the radical promise of Brexit. They want to keep the lid on the shake up of the political system and parliament that Brexit, Brexit offered. They're clinging on for dear life to the levers of power, and I think we should grab back those levers from them. It'll take guts. And talking of guts, and we already heard from our first speaker, a reminder of what happened on London Bridge with that terrorist attack on Friday. You know, the death cult of ISIS once more revealed its ugly, vicious head, determined to destroy democracy, and free society and butchering people in the process. I thought about that that day, faced with a jihadi lunatic like that, do you know what, I think I'd probably run away. I'd cower, I'd be scared, wouldn't you? But wasn't it remarkable, isn't it always remarkable, when in an extraordinary circumstances, ordinary men and women against the odds rise up rose to the challenge and exhibited bravery in buckets. I take inspiration from them. And when I'm getting attacked as a Brexit party MEP, I'm humbled by that kind of courage. Because honestly, politics is tough, but it's not half as frightening as facing a jihadist fascist on the streets of London or anywhere else. But it can take courage and guts to be involved in politics. And I've seen in this general election huge amounts of courage and guts. And we've heard some of our, our, our PPCs here. But, you know, I was in Chester yesterday with Andy Argyle and Martin in the crowd who were standing in Chester. They've taken a hell of a lot of flack. But they're out there every day, like all of the Brexit Party candidates up and down the country, activists and voters taken to the streets. And they're getting the usual vile stick from Remainers and Labour and Lib Dem and Plaid Cymru, but also the cheek of the Tories with a sense of entitlement demanding the Brexit party stand aside and allow them to get the Leave voters without even bothering to win them. What a bloody nerve. But our candidates, activists and voters just say, no way, we're going nowhere, we stand our ground. Listen, to finish... I stood in the EU election. I never have ever wanted to be an elected politician. Still don't want to get sacked. I stood in the EU election because I actually believed, not just in Brexit, but in that slogan, which is more than a slogan, of changing politics for good. And changing politics for good is something I believe we should do, and I meant it. But you really can't change anything if you don't step up and fight for it, vote for it vote for a new movement. You can't say, I want change, and then when presented with a movement that's offering change, say, oh, it's a bit frightening, I won't bother. 
Brexit's great radical promise is not just to technically get us out of the European Union, it is to change politics for good. After all, if the Brexit party can get a Buckley girl onto the national stage, it can do bloody anything. <laughs> the fact is, If the Brexit party have got the political imagination to organise a political rally in Buckley, it proves that it can reach the parts of the UK no other party could do or would bother doing. This contract with the people of Wales is not aimed at the Cardiff Bay bureaucrats or the people who run the North Wales. I mean, you know, talk about the Taffy Mafia. I mean, do you know what I mean? We all know who we're talking about, right? It's not aimed at them. It's aimed at us. Grab it, make it your own, make it real, make it happen. And that doesn't mean you voting Brexit Party. It means you and every single one of you in this room getting out and telling everyone else to vote Brexit Party. Time for change, everyone. Thank you very much.